before Tyler's lesson this morning, we're going to turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and we're going to begin the reading of verse 15 through verse 20. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described it to them that what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he, had, he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim to Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and every, everyone marveled. Well, good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you for the brothers and sisters here at West Mason. So thankful to worship our God together. And we have visitors with us. We're certainly thankful that you have decided to worship our God together with us. If, again, you have any questions about the things that we say or do here today in an effort to praise and glorify our God, we encourage you to ask them uh, at the close of our service here in a little bit. For now, if you are not already there, if you would open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. That's where the lesson will begin in just a moment. Last week, Scott, on Sunday morning, talked about influencers. And in that lesson, he had touched on the great power we have to be influencers to those around us. And so this morning, I want us to consider what it means to share the good news. We are in an age and in a time where sharing something seems second nature, and a lot of it comes from social media. My question to you this morning, though, is... What do you share? What do you find yourself just impulsively sharing? Maybe it's news. If you have a little bit of news, you like to share it with somebody. Maybe it's to help somebody. Even if it's not your news to share, maybe you share news. And we have to be careful of that. Maybe you like sharing your opinion. Maybe you think you've got some good, keen insight on some things, and you like to share your opinion. It's not good or bad. It's just something you might do. It can certainly lead to either of those directions. But you seem like sharing things. And when we think of all the things we can share, that we do share throughout the course of a day, how often do you and I share Jesus with someone? Whether it's in the things that we do or say, we have an opportunity each and every moment that we are breathing to share the good news. That is what the word gospel means. Good news. Specifically, when the Bible uses that word, it's the good news about Jesus. And you have this news, presumably, and you have the opportunity to share it. And this morning, I want us to think about the idea that the gospel is good news that is, by its very nature, something that is shared and spread abroad and proclaimed. And I want to look at three stories with you this morning where good news was shared in the scriptures and see how you and I can put those things into practice, certainly, but even more so to realize that when we do what we're called to do in sharing this good news, God is at work in those things. And it should embolden us to do this work with all the more Zeal. Again, as I've mentioned, the idea that the good news, the gospel, is something that is meant to be shared. It's not something that you just hold closely to your chest and say, well, I'm good to go. And then just pretend like the world is flying by around you and you don't do anything with it. That certainly can be a temptation for some. Maybe all of us at different degrees. But Mark chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, follows up on this incredible story of the man who we don't even know his name, but we know the name of this legion of demons that were in him. 
that were oppressing him, that caused him to be driven away from society and from the touch of a loving hand of family or friends, and that he was tormented in the wilderness, and he was chained and broke the chains. And Jesus, with a word, casts all these demons out into the pigs nearby. And so when we read there in verse 15, where all the people are coming out from the town, and they see this demon-possessed man there, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, that's something remarkable. It's something astounding for these people. Who knew this man? As somebody who had been tormented. You can imagine this man whose life has been drastically altered. And as it says here, he's begging to go with Jesus. All of the people from the surrounding area are terrified. They have no idea what Jesus has just done. They say, please leave, please. You you cost us our pigs. We don't know what you're doing, but we can't have you here anymore. And so you imagine Jesus is getting into this boat, and this man's like, no, take me with you. And the fascinating part we see here in Mark 5 is that Jesus does not permit him. Instead, notice what the Lord tells him in verse 19. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. When we believe the gospel, when Jesus transforms our lives, we don't just go to be with the Lord immediately, but we have a time where we are separated from the Lord, at least in a certain way. Jesus is always with us, but... When we are abiding with him, we look forward to the day when we can be with him in eternity. In the interim, with the lives that we have been given, we have a calling just like this man. Go and tell. That seems maybe like a daunting task until you realize Jesus is just simply telling this man to go tell your story. Go home to the people you haven't been able to be around for so long, who you've been separated from because of this thing you've been dealing with, go to them and tell them about what has happened to you. The good news of Jesus is that it takes us from the oppression and slavery of our sin, my self-righteous attitude that separates me from God, and that it nails it to the cross where Jesus is. And in that removes, when I obey the gospel, that I can now be acceptable in the sight of God as his child. Why would I not tell that to people? The amazing thing here for us to realize as it ends in verse 20, as this man goes through the Decapolis, this region of ten cities, and is telling everyone, you can imagine that people might recognize him a little bit, and he starts telling, let me tell you what this man Jesus did for me. And it says there that everyone marveled. The people who came and told Jesus to leave probably marveled as well. People are going to react to the good news in different ways. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be shared with people that we think aren't going to respond positively to it. The good news is meant to be shared. It's up to each individual soul as to what we're going to do with it, what they're going to do with it. Everyone will marvel, but then it's a choice after that. You and I have this awesome opportunity to be this shining example, to tell people our story. And when we talk about this, often the word evangelism gets brought up, because it's a nice, easy term that means sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus, the opportunity they have to obey and become a Christian as well. And I'm afraid sometimes we look at evangelism as a spiritual gift for the few. The person up front who's good at talking, they can go out and knock on doors and talk to people. Or I've got a family member or somebody in the church who I know is really good at bringing people from their neighborhood and is talking to people at work, and they're bringing people from time to time to come into the worship building, and they're setting up Bible studies, and that's awesome for them. But me, I'm not cut out for it. Let me make this abundantly clear, brothers and sisters, and it's something that I wrestle with on the regular, so please don't think that I'm standing up here as having this all figured out. Evangelism, 
telling people, sharing the good news about Jesus is not a spiritual gift or a talent for the few. It is your duty and responsibility as a child of God to tell people about your king, to tell people of your savior, about what he's done for you. And if the weight and impact of really thinking about what the gospel is, about how we were no better off than this demon-possessed man, and that Jesus radically transforms our lives for infinitely better opportunity, then we lose sight and we do get sheepish. We do turn inward and not think about the opportunity and responsibility that we have as a Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 3, if you turn here, I believe Peter makes it pretty clear that this is a responsibility for every single person who calls on the name of the Lord, that they would be ready at every opportunity. In 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered for those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Peter makes it pretty clear here that if you're living the life that you're called to live, if you are shining, it's going to lead to opportunities to share. Because he tells you, you always need to be ready and prepared to make a defense, to explain what this hope is that causes you to live the way that you live. And so it's natural that when we're living the life that Jesus says is the good life, the abundant life that he offers... People are going to wonder. People are going to ask. It's going to lead us to tell and do and say things that are going to make people question and ask us about this hope. Whether it's sincerely or whether it's mockingly, it doesn't matter. It's an open door. Shining leads to sharing. I want you to think about this. And this is awesome to consider. If you knew enough to obey the gospel, you know everything you need to share it. Let me say that again. If you are a Christian, as the Bible defines a Christian, and you've obeyed this good news, you have all the information you need to share it with somebody so that they can obey it. Isn't that awesome? We don't have to be experts. We don't have to have the entire Bible memorized. We need to know the good news and we need to share it. Will questions come up? Yeah, that's fine. We can study together. We can learn these things. But sharing the good news of Jesus doesn't mean I have a PhD in biblical theology or Bible studies. It means that I know my Savior, my Lord, and I'm going to tell other people about him. I think we shoot ourselves in the foot way too often when it comes to this. We try to imagine, what if they ask me this? What if they ask me that? That's great. They're asking questions. We need to learn to let the gospel display its power and stop trying to plan a way for it to do its work. In Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Everyone. It is the power of God. But when I try to get in and muddle with things and try to make the gospel fit what I think this person needs, I'm taking away its power because I'm turning it into something that's not good news. I think this is what Paul's getting at in 1 Corinthians in the first chapter. This is one of the verses that struck me very strongly when I began preaching, and I always come back to, and it strikes me even as I read it today. In 1 Corinthians 17, where Paul simply says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Personally, As a preacher, the fact that if I try to sound too smart or too hoity-toity and wise up here, 
could empty the cross of Christ of its power? That's humbling to me. That's a warning to me. That makes me sit up, stand up, and take notice. The gospel doesn't need my help. The good news of Jesus doesn't need fixing or adjusting or tweaking to make it especially appealing to one person over another. If it is what it says it is, if it is the good news of the Son of God that's come and died for the sins of mankind, there's nothing you can add to it to make it any better. But we sit here and we think, oh, I need to present it in just this way, or maybe I'll leave this part out for this person. No, you see, we empty the cross of its power when we do that. We also have the bad habit sometimes of jumping ahead, and instead of sharing the good news, we're just trying to get somebody wet in the baptistry. Trust me, the Bible teaches that you need to be baptized to be saved, and that is the beginning of the walk with Jesus. But notice how Paul says it here. I'm not going just to make sure how many times I can count people going underwater. He didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What results from that? He says in context, lots of people are baptizing because there are hearts and souls that are ready to obey Jesus. But when we go ahead and jump ahead and focus on the wrong aspect, instead of, instead of just simply sharing the gospel, we empty it of its power. The good news is meant to be shared in the pure form that we find it in the scriptures. So instead of trying to dress it up in the way that you think your friend or family member needs to hear it, just let God speak through his word. Go and tell everything that Jesus has done for you and show them who Jesus is in his word. When we think about this, this is not your job that you're coming up with. The good news is actually God's work. He's doing it through your life and through my life, but the good news, the gospel, is God's work. There's another story of the good news being shared over in John chapter 4. It's a story that many of us will be familiar with, and it's one we come back to time and again just because of how powerful it is of the Samaritan woman having this one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus and these moments of vulnerability and shock and worry and it leads to Jesus being so tender with this woman and calling her into this relationship with God. And it causes her to leave why she was there in the first place and go and start telling people, come and see this man that told me everything I had ever done. And they start coming out to him. You pick up in John chapter 4 and verse 34. And the disciples come back and they're worried about Jesus having lunch, which I get it, I, I understand and they're saying, did somebody bring him food? Jesus, as he's talking to them in verse 34, says to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. I want you to stop here with me and just think about this for a moment. When Jesus is saying this, he's not necessarily looking over a literal field. What is he seeing when he tells his disciples, lift up your eyes and look around you? It's crowds of Samaritan people coming to see him because of what this woman has said. Lift up your eyes and look around, my followers. There are people who need to know their God. Picking up in verse 36, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into that labor. This is not all on your shoulders. This is about people experiencing God in many different ways, through many different relationships, and you have a role to play. But it's not going to happen if our eyes are always fixed down on our own feet and we're not up looking around at the white harvest around us. We need to see the harvest like Jesus teaches his disciples here to look around and see. It's not four months from now. It's in this moment. There are people around you that God's calling you to do his work in their lives. It's very similar to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Where Jesus says something similar to the idea of the fields being white for harvest. Matthew chapter 9, 
verses 35 through 38. Jesus says here, goes throughout, in verse 35, goes throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Do you think there are helpless and harassed people in your life that go to work with you, that are in your own home? They need Jesus, and Jesus wants them. Whether you're frustrated by them or not, or whether they're your best friend, Jesus wants them. He has compassion for them. And it's his compassion that should motivate our compassion to reach out and share. The powerful thing with this verse to me is when Jesus sends the directive to say, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'd send out laborers, be mindful that you are the answer to your own prayer in a lot of instances, if you were to insert yourself there. I'm going to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he's going to send out laborers into his vineyard. Good job, Scott and Tyler. Go on out there. You're the answer to that prayer for someone. I'm the answer to that prayer for someone. You are laborers in the vineyard. There are people all around you. And our purpose as Christians is not just to be comfortable in life. It's not just to coast on by or to ease into it or to do enough good deeds. Our purpose is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it's that perspective that's going to keep us going, that's going to cause us to lift up our eyes and to see. You are made to share this good news that has changed your life. Paul makes it clear that those who are following Christ are fellow workers of God. Back in 1 Corinthians now in chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. Paul describes it here in terms of tending a garden. That there's lots of work to be done if there's going to be something new that grows there. And you have a role to play, but don't make any mistake about who's going to cause that growth. Just as in nature... The growth of a Christian comes from the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 4. For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And so Paul here is talking about him and Apollos going in and being God's fellow workers, and then the the church is God's field that they're working in, but the opportunity for all of us to be fellow workers with God. You can plant, you can water. You can't force somebody to obey this great news. But you've got a role to play. And you've got trust that you can put in God, that he's going to be the one to give the growth. Because that's what happens with the Samaritan woman and all these people she invites to come out to see Jesus. Back in John chapter 4, let's pick up and finish that story. In John 4 and verse 39. After Jesus explains that the fields are white and ready, that there's an opportunity to harvest souls in the kingdom of God, he receives these people that come to him. In verse 39, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. It is not your job to force somebody into salvation. 
It's not within your power. The only person you can control in this life, whether you believe it or not, is you. It's up to you whether you accept the gospel. It's up to you whether you have a relationship with God. And it's up to you whether you're going to play this role as God assigns to plant, to water, to bring people to Jesus, to share your testimony as this woman does, and to let the gospel be the gospel, to let Jesus be Jesus so that we can turn to one another and say, I know that it was my wife who introduced me to the gospel, but it's no longer because of her testimony. It's because I have come to know and believe. That's powerful. I just came up with that right now, so sorry, dear. <laughs> but this is the awesome piece of the story of the church, that it's because of what one person might do or say that it brings somebody to know their creator. Is that not worth being a little bit uncomfortable? Or worst case scenario saying, I'm not interested? More opportunity to pray. More opportunity to grow. Make no mistake, regardless of what we think or not, the good news is always relevant. One more story for you from the Gospels of somebody receiving this good news, and this one is in Acts chapter 8. If you open your Bibles there and turn into Acts chapter 8. This is the story of Philip. And if you read in Acts 6, he's one of those that is appointed by the apostles to take care of the Hellenistic widows and those who are being neglected in daily distributions. He's assigned to this special role to serve the church. And there's another man, Stephen, who's appointed along with him. He, in chapter 7, ends up being martyred for his faith. He dies proclaiming Jesus. And so the rest of them end up scattering. This is where we pick up with Philip. You see in verses 4 through 8, I won't read it for you, but you can see it's kind of a summary of Jesus is working in Philip's life. As he's going from town to town, he's preaching the word. He's going to Samaria and proclaiming the Christ, and there are many who are believing. You get this little interlude with Peter coming down because of Simon the magician, but you pick up with Philip in verse 26, if you look there in Acts 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. A couple things to notice from Philip's story, that the gospel is relevant Anywhere, Whether it's in big, bustling towns or whether it's in a desert place. Who in the world in their right mind is going to be in the middle of a hot, abandoned place in the middle of the day when it's most disadvantageous to be outside in this place, in this climate? God tells him, you open your eyes. There's a door of opportunity. God will open the door. The gospel is relevant anywhere. The gospel is relevant 
at any time. As we've already mentioned, this is at noon. It's the hottest part of the day. But I also want you, I also want you to think about this. Philip is still reeling from the death of Stephen. He's at least having some notion and understanding that the thing that he is doing, proclaiming Jesus, is exactly what got Stephen stoned to death. But the gospel is still relevant, whether it's in times of peace or in times of persecution, whether it's comfortable and easy for me to share, or whether it demands a sacrifice and risk on my part. The gospel is relevant and it's worth sharing anytime. And the gospel is worth sharing with anyone, from crowds to Simon the sorcerer, who's admittedly a little confused at first, to this man who doesn't look like Philip, he doesn't dress like Philip, he's not from the same socioeconomic class as Philip, this is a rich man on important business. And he still comes up to him and he says, do you understand what you're reading? I love the visual that we get here because this Ethiopian invites him up into the chariot with him. And this is exactly what you and I are called to do. Not to badger down and berate people to say, this is what you need to know about God. But to come alongside people and sit together with an open Bible and say, this is who God says he is. Let's talk about this. Let's study it and read it together. And so when these questions come up, who's this one that was denied justice? His life was taken away, and he didn't even say anything about it. Verse 35, to me, is the key to understanding how we share the good news from Philip's example. Starting with this verse, he says. Philip opens his mouth, and beginning with this scripture in Isaiah 53, he tells him the good news about Jesus. There are going to be people who know their Bible really well, and you can get into minutia and details. There are going to be people who wouldn't know the Bible from an encyclopedia. You're going to approach that conversation differently. Start where they are. Think about the soul, the individual who's in front of you when you're sharing the good news. And meet them where they're at. Draw them to Christ. Point them to Jesus. So we need to meet people where they are. But we actually skipped the second point that said first. When, when Philip opens his mouth. This is one that I still have mulling around in my head sometimes and I think about you don't make disciples of Christ by being nice to people let me say that one again you don't make disciples of Christ you don't help people become Christians just by being nice to them there's a part for that there, that's part of shining we need to open our mouths we need to speak Jesus, We need to speak the gospel of truth. There's going to be opportunities for that specifically to happen. I believe Philip's displaying Christ in all the ways he's interacting with Philip up until this point. But when the opportunity is there and he asks, he opens his mouth and he tells them exactly who Jesus is. May you and I do the same. That we would be bold to open our mouths to speak truth and life to people and to tell them about Jesus. That yes, we would display it in our actions, but that we would speak Jesus as our Lord and Savior to them so that they would understand that this is truly good news. The thing about good news, though, is it's good news in and of itself. The question is, is it your good news? Is it good news for me and for you? You have the choice, whether this is just some fanciful tale, whether this is just something some guy got up and yammered on about for half an hour on a Sunday morning, or whether this, as it's proven in the scriptures, really is the best news you have ever heard and ever will hear because it is God's authored plan of salvation. And that when you believe that, when you and I as the church have done that, we don't stop. 
We follow the final marching orders of Jesus from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. These are our marching orders to represent the kingdom of God and to invite others to join it. And if you need help with a very quick and easy way to start doing that this week, we have a gospel meeting coming up. We have a guest preacher who has a series of lessons. We have flyers sitting out there. And as I told folks here that were here on Wednesday night, I'll say it again. Those flyers don't do any good sitting back there on the table. Are you going to open your mouth and tell people? Are you going to invite people to meet this Jesus? Not the preacher who's going to be here. Antoine's great. I'm excited for him to be here. We're inviting people to hear about Jesus. So pick one person who's not in the church. One person who needs to know the Lord better. You can give them the flyer. You can tell them about it. You can offer to pray for them. Something. The flyer is the easy thing. Pick it up and hand it to them. And they'll ask you what's this. Then you have to open your mouth. But do not neglect the opportunities that we have that are around us. The great opportunity to share the good news about Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and if you have not obeyed this gospel, if you haven't done what this Ethiopian did, if you haven't done what Jesus instructs us to do here, to believe and obey, to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and to be buried in the waters of baptism so that your sins can be washed away, you have that opportunity right now to obey the gospel so that you too, like this man we read about in Acts 8, you can go on your way rejoicing, walking in the Lord and being part of a family of God's people that you will have for the rest of your life. So the option is yours. We're singing this song, Wonderful Story of Love. I want you to think about this great story of love we've talked about this morning and how it fits into your story, how you need Jesus. And if you need to act, if you need to ask for prayers, if you need to ask questions, or if you need to get up here and obey the gospel, don't wait any longer. Now is the time. Come forward as we 